to our uh, educational forum sponsored by Arlington Democrats on the national popular vote. Uh, we have uh, two really knowledgeable people about the national popular vote, and I'm going to introduce them in a minute. But first, um, for those who don't know me, uh, I was a government attorney for uh, the federal government for 32 years. I retired at the end of 2018, and I started volunteering with Arlington Democrats, and I got more involved in, in um, local issues, and also uh, I got interested in this national popular vote issue, and I learned more and more about it, and I really just want to share um, with uh, all of you, and of course for Arlington Dems, uh, we want the electorate to be educated, and learning more about our system uh, is the way to do that. So uh, I want to thank everybody for coming here and participating. I know it's, um, it's Bruce Springsteen's birthday today. Uh, he's 71, uh, and I really appreciate that everybody's um, coming out to this and putting off your celebrations till later on in the evening. Um, so um, we really want to get questions from everybody. There's several different ways to ask questions. Um, Zoom does have a raise hand function in the participants button. And if you click on the participants button, uh, you'll see another raise hand button. Um, you can also just put questions in the chat if you're familiar with that, with your chat button. And then um, we should be able to just look at the screens and if everybody's jumping up and down and waving your hand, uh, we'll probably recognize you and you'll get a chance to uh, ask your question. But um, first I wanna let our panelists um, just give a little background. Um, so I want to introduce um, our panelists, uh, but first I have to thank uh, Meredith Sumter, who's uh, hosting this meeting, and she's going to keep track of, um, try to keep track of the participant uh, and the hand raise button and the chat and that sort of thing, and basically keep me straight on this. So thank you, Meredith, very much. Um, so we have uh, two people here from the National Popular Vote Organization. We have Eileen Reavy, who's a political and nonprofit consultant based in Portland, Oregon, uh, Oregon, I guess. Eileen co-founded the Grassroots Advocacy Group for National Popular Vote in Oregon and now serves as National Popular Vote's National Grassroots Director. Eileen has visited 12 states on behalf of National Popular Vote. We also have Scott Drexel. He's a longtime advisor to some of the country's most active democratic donors, activists, and business leaders. He serves on finance committees for several national democratic committees. He's been active in the campaigns of numerous candidates, and he's worked in over 30 states on behalf of the national popular vote. So we have um, some really good people here. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, Meredith, did that cover everything? You did beautifully. One last thing, public yes. service announcement. We are recording this session um, and we will be um, posting it to the Arlington Democrats website and also to social media so we can, you know, we can share this knowledge um, of this informational session with others. Um, and as such, also, uh, thank you. Look, we're in the Zoom world where everybody knows uh, that we're, you should be muted until you want to speak. So bless you on that. But if you feel comfortable keeping your video on, I think it's intimate enough. We have 21 of us. Um, that way we can see you. Um, and that would be great in terms of the person-to-person the -person engagement. Um, if you're comfortable. If you're not, don't worry about that. Uh, and otherwise, uh, thanks for your time this evening. And thanks, thanks to Eileen and to Scott as well. Yes, indeed. So um, I'm going to open up with a, a simple two-part question for Eileen here. Um, Eileen, could you uh, first just give people a basic review of the current electoral college system and the way it works, and then maybe just uh, explain briefly what the national popular vote interstate compact is and how that would work? Yeah, thanks, Doug. So the way that we elect our president now is through the Electoral College. So you and I cast our ballots in November, but the real election for president is uh, when 538 electors meet in December and cast their ballots. Currently, 48 of our states and DC use winner-take-all laws to decide how to award their electors. So what that means is in Virginia and Maryland and most of the rest of the country, on election day, whoever gets the most votes within your state 
gets awarded all of the electoral votes for your state. Um, and each uh, state has a, the equivalent number of electors for every representative they have in Congress. So every state has at least two for their two U.S. senators and one for the U.S. House member. Um, and so what this really means is in California, for example, if a Democratic candidate receives the most votes, they get all 55 electoral votes. Same thing in Texas, if the Republican receives the most votes on election day, they get all 38 of the electoral votes uh, for the Republican candidate. So if you look at an election like 2016, if you were one of the four and a half million Californians who cast your ballot for Donald Trump, or one of the 3.8 million Texans who cast your ballot for Hillary Clinton, your vote was effectively thrown out at the state line. Uh, and you, you had zero representation within your state in the electoral college. And so this is all a matter of state law. Uh, a lot of folks think that the winner-take-all system is baked into the Constitution, but it's not. Uh, the Constitution leaves it up to the states how they're going to award their electors. Specifically, it says Article 2, Section 1 states that each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. And so what our bill does, the National Popular Vote Compact, is it asks states to award their electors instead to the winner of the national popular vote. And this bill would only go into effect in states after at least 270 electoral votes have been committed to the compact, which means that it, that's the number you need to win the electoral college. So it only goes into effect when it would guarantee the presidency to the national popular vote winner. Okay, I think quick, quick minor question here. So uh, you mentioned uh, when the electors, the 538 electors meet and cast their ballots. So um, I know that the House of Representatives meets at the Capitol and the Senate meets at the Capitol on the north side. Where uh, do these 500, where do these, uh, in Washington, do these 538 electors meet to uh, cast their ballot? That's a good question. So the electors actually meet in their respective state capitals. So they don't all go to DC, they go to their own state capital and cast their ballots there. So they don't really get to meet and confer and use their individual judgment and their collective wisdom to decide who the next president should be. Uh, nope, for the most part, they cast their ballot for whoever they, they said they would when they ran to be an elector or otherwise tried to be an elector. It's a little bit different in every state. Uh, and the vast majority of them vote a, as expected to. And there's, there's no conversation among them about, oh, should it be someone else? Is this really the right person to lead? That dialogue uh, doesn't happen anymore. Okay, thank you very much. Now I got a question for Scott. Um, Scott, can you just briefly describe the, the current status of <clears throat> the national popular vote nationwide? Sure. So uh, national popular vote has been passed uh, in 16 states or 15 plus the district. Uh, and together, those uh, jurisdictions account for 196 electoral votes between them. So as, as Eileen mentioned, national popular vote takes effect when states representing 270 electoral votes have, have opted in. So what happens now is those laws sit on the books in those 16 different jurisdictions and nothing happens until you hit that 270 70 vote trigger. So as more states come into the compact and that number grows from 196 to 205 to 215 and so on, um, once it hits 270, uh, the compact triggers and the candidate with the most votes in all 50 states in the District of Columbia becomes president. It's sort of important to point out that, that we're not just counting the votes of, of the states that are compacting, but actually the votes in all 50 states. So if you had 49 states and one opt into the compact and one state didn't, it, it doesn't matter. As long as there are over 270 electoral votes in the compact, the mechanism by which the slate of electors is chosen for one candidate or the other is the candidate who receives the most votes in all 50 states in the district. Well, thank you, Scott. And since we're sponsored by Arlington Democrats here in Virginia, uh, could you just, uh, is, has Virginia passed this uh, national popular vote bill? So um, it was up this year uh, and the House passed it on a fairly party line vote. Um, what's unfortunate about the, the sort of current circumstances around national popular vote is that it's become far more partisan than frankly it ever really needed to be. 
Um, we got started back in 2006. And at the time, um, I, I think we were accused of being a bunch of angry anti-Bush liberals. And there may have been a couple of us who were, but uh, that that wasn't the the driving factor behind it. We were 10 years too early for, for Donald Trump, but you know, people still sort of accuse us of being an anti-Trump group. The, the truth is, as we got further and further from 2000, um, I, I think there was less of a knee-jerk reaction against uh, national popular vote, particularly on the right. Um, and we were able to get considerably more bipartisan support than, than we'd ever gotten before, up to and including um, passing, when we passed New York, the assembly was under heavy Democratic control, the Senate was under Republican control, and it passed the Senate, I want to say 57 to 4, two Republicans, two Democrats voted against it. It went on to pass the Oklahoma House, the Arizona Senate, places where there was heavy sort of uh, Republican majorities. Um, Post-2016, the, the political reality is that it's been seen through a, a lens um, of, of Trump. And, and for many people, if you're okay with, with Donald Trump, you're, you're probably okay with the way that he got elected. So um, I, I think once uh, Democrats took control of, of both chambers of the legislature last year, um, I think it, it opened some roads uh, post-2016 that hadn't been available to us. So um, it's all a very long way of saying we, we're still working very hard for bipartisan support. The bill is currently before the Senate Privileges and Elections Committee, the bill that was passed by the House. Um, typically what happens is the Privileges and Elections Committee holds a meeting in the interim period between uh, November 3rd and I believe December 3rd is the cutoff to determine what bills that are still in committee that, that can be voted directly to the floor uh, come January of the 2021 session. So that's currently what we're working toward um, is, is clearing the Privileges and Elections Committee and assuming we do that, um, will be on the floor for a full vote uh, in, in January uh, on the Senate side. If that doesn't end up happening, if the hearing is, is canceled or the issue is not taken up for whatever reason, um, it will uh, it, it will just have to go back through the, the House of Delegates again. Okay, that's that's really good. Um, didn't I read somewhere that uh, Trump himself said that he would prefer a popular vote to the Electoral College? Yeah, you got to refresh Twitter to figure out where he is on any given day. Um, he's he he's many times uh, either been on Fox and Friends and made some offhand comment about um, you know I, I would have won the electoral or the popular vote by an even larger margin you know and 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 I I think um, going back to 2012 there was a point when uh, it, it looked like there was a, a possibility that. Uh, Mitt Romney could win the popular vote, but that Barack Obama would, would win uh, re-election via the Electoral College. And at the time, Trump tweeted, uh, the Electoral College is a travesty and must go, which was just irony in foresight. But, um, you know, in, in, in the intervening years, he said multiple times, you know, I, I would have been able to rack up Republican votes in, Col in California and, and New York. Um, but you know those those tweets, uh, those one-off comments are almost always followed by. But I love the electoral college because it makes me go to places I would otherwise never go to. Well, you know, the facts uh, kind of belie that. It's not like Donald Trump is landing in, you know, uh, Wyoming and North Dakota and Montana. It's still the same places that, that he's always gone. So um, I, I don't, you know, to the extent that he may have expressed some openness to the popular vote in the past. Uh, clearly, it's not going to be the defining rule set for this election. Um, and, and the hope is that, that we will have it in place for the, in time for the 2024 election. So he, he open, but certainly not, not willing to lift a finger to help us at this point. Well, I'm going to throw this next one up um, for both uh, Eileen and Scott, and you guys can, can um, uh, you know, answer it sequentially or, or whatever you think is best. But as you guys have traveled around the country and you've met and talked with people in many different states, uh, some of which have, have passed this, some of which have not, what are the most common arguments or objections that you hear people say or, th or that people have? Or maybe another way to phrase that is, what are the most common misunderstandings that people have about um, the national popular vote uh, bill? Scott, do you want to go ahead and, and start off with that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, so 
we have a very involved academic tome that's like 1500 pages long that gets into very, very nitty gritty detail on every possible um, objection to national popular vote that, that you could imagine. In reality, there may be 10 um, that come up more, more frequently than others. Um, the, 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 so the, the more common ones are national popular votes unconstitutional. Um, that's an easy one. Maybe Article two, section one of the constitution um, is probably one of the most clearly uh, enumerated state powers in the entire US constitution. I mean, it, 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 it is unambiguous. Um, the, the, the authority to determine the method for, elect, for awarding electors is uh, plenary and absolute uh, in its, its vesting in the state. So ones like that are very easy. Um, others are, this somehow is inconsistent with what the, the founders had intended. You know, the, the way we currently do things is not in the Constitution. It was not discussed at the Constitutional Convention. In fact, most of the founders were dead by the time we ended up with a, a prevalent uh, use of, of a winner-take-all system. It was a result of sort of pre-Civil War uh, uh, electoral wrangling, um, really. So, you know, the current system, if, if anything, if you go back and read the Federalist Papers, the one thing the founders were, were clearly trying to do was to prevent a scenario in which any one, case, one state or small group of states could exercise undue influence over, um, over the entire process, which is exactly what we have now. You have five, six, seven states that are wholly determinative of the outcome of a presidential election. So the idea that this is somehow inconsistent with the founders and their intent is, is easily dismissed. I mean, it, it, what we have now is really antithetical to that. Um, others are, you know, the, that small states are protected under the current system. Um, I think there's this belief that, that somehow the, the structure of the Electoral College was intended to protect rural areas or, or small states. The, the truth is small, a, a small blue state like Vermont in a small red state like Wyoming and a big blue state like Illinois and a big red state like Texas are all equally ignored. Where political power comes from is being in the middle. And that, that is true in, in any election, but certainly in a presidential election. Presidential campaigns go where th their investment of resources can tip the balance one way or the other. So, uh, I mean, if, if small states were, were somehow empowered by the current system, you know, the saying would be, as goes Wyoming, so goes the nation. And, and we all know uh, th that that's not the case. Um, I'll, I'll just do one or two more. And then, Eileen, if you want to kind of jump in with a couple others, um, you know, big cities are, are going to control national elections if we switch to a popular vote. Um, cities are neither big enough nor blue enough to, to on their own, elect um, presidents or, or, or governors or senators or any other popularly elected um, uh, office. Uh, if, if you add up, take the population of the United States, about one sixth live in what would be census designated uh, rural areas. And those areas tend to vote about 60, 40 Republican. If you add up, uh, about one sixth live in uh, urban areas and those vote about 60, 40 Democrat. The remaining two thirds of the country live in suburbs and exurbs, which you know, few places know quite as well as Virginia. That is 50, 50. Um, you know, if you take the 50 largest cities in America, 15% of the population. If you go up to hundred, it's 16% of the population. The, the, the cities are, are not big enough on their own to elect um, uh, a president. And, and if they were, you would see it on the state level. Uh, Larry Hogan is not the governor of, of Maryland because he's carrying Baltimore. Charlie Baker is not the governor of Massachusetts because he's carrying Boston. It, it, it's because those areas are, are certainly blue and they're certainly big, but they're far from the be all end all of, of what a, a population wide campaign looks like. Um, I'll, I'll stop there, Eileen, if you wanna kind of jump in on, on a couple. Yeah. Um, another kind of misconception that people have is that there's going to be an absolute nightmare for, of recounts and we're, we're not going to know the results of the election and how are you going to add them all up. Um, but that's just simply not true. Like one, it's not impossible to count the ballots in the first place. And two, any problems around recounts or not having enough time necessarily to count ballots 
that's a problem of the current system as well. Um, and in fact, I think we'll honestly see that potentially play out this election cycle with an increase in the number of mail-in ballots, um, that that's not a problem because of you know, our bill, that's a problem of the current system. Um, and in fact, our bill provides an opportunity for Congress to consider it and change it if they decide that they wanna uh, adopt a national recount bill in the future. Um, similarly, some people will try and say that there's going to be voter fraud because of this, which again, when you just think about it, if you're uh, in Florida in 2000, you can change the entire outcome of the US presidency by either suppressing or uh, manipulating 550 votes as opposed to if you had had a na nationwide popular vote for president in that election, in order to change the outcome, you would have had to manipulate or suppress over 550,000. Um, so really it's something that, the voter fraud is not incentivized by uh, the national popular vote. It makes it harder for those kind of manipulations or problems to have an effect on the overall outcome of the presidency. Um, some of the other things are just around some of the more technicalities of it, um, like that we, you know, we're going to have states trying to game the system by jumping in the compact or jumping out, you know, a month before the election. Um, and our bill is structured so that that cannot happen. There is a six month blackout period where um, states cannot withdraw from the compact. That's between July 20th of a presidential election year and January 20th of the following year. And so that's intended to make it so that, you know, once the major parties have chosen their candidates for the entire campaign and through Inauguration Day, they're going to know that either we're using the national popular vote to decide this or we're using the current system. Um, and that's not something that's enforced by Scott or I or even, you know, a governor of any given state. Um, it's enforced by the Supremacy Clause in the Constitution and so the Supreme Court as well. Um, and I think that's probably hits our, our greatest hits of the, the misconceptions we hear the most. I would, I would only add one more thing. It's just that in 90% of the objections that we hear on, on national popular vote, the answer, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, is what I am saying also true of the current system? Um, anytime you have a national election, the outcome of which is wholly determinative uh, or I should say the, the, the states where their, where their outcome is determinative of the national result, anything that happens in any of those states has a massively outsized impact. There are 150 million people that will cast ballots in November. Um, when you think of voter fraud, voter suppression, uh, which, which, whichever your persuasion might believe, may lead you to believe exists one way or the other. Um, if you keep uh, 150, 250,000 people from voting out of a pool of 150 million, it's kind of a drop in the bucket. But if you can do something in a state like Wisconsin, where you have voter ID, or you uh, purge the voter rolls, or you uh, make it harder for students to vote, every little thing that you're doing is chipping away a tenth of a percent, a quarter of a percent, a half a percent. And that adds up in a way that if you can keep 10,000 people from voting or 20,000 people from voting just in Wisconsin, that's the ball game. So I think that the two things to sort of look at in 90% of what we, what we hear is number one, is it a problem with the current system? And number two, does someone's perception of the current system protecting against um, kind of election shenanigans actually enhance their impact? Um, and I, I think those, those issues uh, repeat themselves frequently. Okay, if you guys have um, kind of gone through the main ones, then I'd like to see if we have any questions from the audience. Uh, Meredith, do we have anybody um, asking some questions? Because I got some more if, if our audience doesn't have any. I got, I got several. Uh, I, uh, I think everyone who's had a question, they have chatted them directly in the chat box. Uh, and so um, the first one uh, comes from Mike Heminger, uh, who says, um, he, he's curious what would happen if, let's say, DC and Puerto Rico become states? Would this change anything? And would each state need to go back and revise or amend language that has already been passed? So the, the, the way that the legislation is written is it requires a majority of the electoral college. It doesn't require a specific number. So 
uh, DC would probably be, I mean, it's three, three electoral votes, um, and Puerto Rico, let's see, was, uh, we were looking at this the other day, uh, I mean, is it like three and a half million people? So that's seven to nine electoral votes, depending on it. So it, it would increase the total number of electoral votes. So wherever the 50% plus one mark is, instead of needing 270 electoral votes to go into effect, it would need 270 plus six, seven, eight additional electors. But it wouldn't require the states to go back and do anything to, um, to, to their own legislation in, in terms of the states that have already passed it. There's nothing that would change it. I'll tell you one interesting wrinkle, though. Um, the 23rd Amendment to the Constitution gives Washington, D.C. three electoral votes. Um, if Washington, D.C. were admitted as a state, it is entitled to electors as a state equal to the total number of representatives and senators. It would also still be entitled to electors under the 23rd Amendment. Yeah. So that yeah. will be an ongoing issue that's, that's, that once, if and when DC is admitted as a state, um, how to deal with the 23rd Amendment, that has nothing to do with national popular vote, but it, it is a slight wrinkle. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, I also just wanted to flag, I believe, Eric Lasker. I think you, you might have a question, sir. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so first of all, uh, I voted with the majority seven of the eight presidential elections, past presidential elections, and only won five of them. So I do understand the appeal of that from a partisan position. Um, but I still am a, a bit of a skeptic on this um, statute. And so I want to sort of express my view on that. My understanding of sort of the impetus behind this idea, or one of the impetuses behind the idea, is that under the current system, a handful of states sort of decide the election, and everybody else in the country is really their votes don't matter, and they're not um, the presidential candidates don't campaign for them, and, and they're sort of ignored. Um, but in any election, under any situation setting candidates are going to focus on where they get the most bang for the buck where it matters the most to them and we do have a representative democracy so in my mind the question is uh, under the current system if you're focusing on if the candidates are focusing on swing states or the people who live in swing states which often have you know a, a mix of cities and suburbs and urban and, rural areas and a, and a sort of diversity of population, are they more representative of the country as a whole than people who live in the highest population, highest density population centers like cities where candidates would have the most bang for their buck campaigning under the system you propose? And I'll go back on you. Um, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll start with this and Scott can jump in if needed. Um, when we look at candidates that are just going to swing states, um, I mean, I think that that's, it's more than just campaigning in those particular swing states is one thing I want to point out first. Um, swing states receive between 7.2 and 7.6% more federal grants that are worth about 5.7% more federal grant dollars every year. Um, so if you look at an average size state like Tennessee, if they'd been a swing state in 2008, uh, they would have likely would have received 300 more federal grants every year for a total of $60 million per year in the four years leading up to an election. So there's big implications for that. You know, swing states are also twice as likely to get a disaster declaration from the federal government and all the money that comes with that. Um, and they help shape policy on the campaign trail. Like we see candidates and sitting presidents shape their policies around what does well with voters in particular states. So whether that's no child left behind because it does well with education minded voters in the critical swing state of Ohio or Medicare Part D with voters in Florida um, or, you know, investments by a sitting government, sitting president like President Obama uh, when he had an energy, green energy infrastructure program, the battleground state of Ohio company, their companies in that state got four times the amount of money that went to um, the rest of the country. And so there, there's a lot of implications beyond campaigning. And so 
I don't necessarily think that those states are necessarily, you know, the swing states, they're not somehow representative of the country. It's just that they happen to be closely divided during an election year. Um, and also when we're, when candidates are campaigning under a national popular vote, they're not just going to go to those major metropolitan areas, you know, a hundred largest cities, as Scott said, that's only 19% of the U.S. population. That and hundred, the number 100 on that list is Spokane, Washington with 200 8,000 people, which is not exactly a giant liberal metropolis. Um, so candidates are going to go all over the country and talk and campaign in all 50 states because they are going to, they solicit every vote that matters. And under our system, every vote will be politically relevant. Yeah, I, I think, look, I, I worked on the Obama campaign in, in Southern Ohio. Um, and, and my, I have to keep my voice down because my mother-in-law is visiting. My wife and her family are from Ohio. Um, you know, the idea that any one place is, is representative of the rest of the country is, is difficult for me to swallow because I'm from San Francisco, California, and I'm sorry, it ain't Ohio. But it's, it's, a, it's a different feel, and I, I think when we say we're a representative democracy, we're a representative democracy because we elect people to represent us. We're not abdicating our political power to people who live in an area that might kind of look like America. Florida is an incredibly diverse place. Um, there are big cities. There are highly rural areas. There is, are industrial centers. There are retirement places. It doesn't look like the rest of the country. It is Florida. West Virginia is West Virginia. Virginia is Virginia. Texas is Texas. So I think the idea that we should step back and let Ohio and, and Wisconsin and Michigan sort of determine the presidency sort of, um, I, I think, forfeits unnecessarily the power that, that we have individually as voters. You, you would never have that kind of conversation in a state where you say, okay, well, um, you know, Buffalo, New York is, is representative of most of New York. So let's not campaign in New York City or in Albany or in outstate New York. You know, we're just going to campaign in Buffalo because that sort of looks like the, the rest of the state. No, every vote within New York counts and every vote within Virginia counts. So I, I, I think, um, you know, the, the only way to get an even sampling is to get an even sampling, make, make every vote count. I don't trust, I really don't trust someone in Wisconsin to make uh, the, the, the determination of who should be the next president for me. If, if not only because of the voters, but because of their laws. Um, you know, the laws in, in Wisconsin as they relate to permissive voting are candidly not great. So, you know, I can do everything I want to in California to, to make sure that people have access to the ballot, to make sure that people can vote early, to make sure that people who are at home can vote at home. But, Really, it doesn't matter for the presidential election. I am my hands are tied based on what is going to happen in Wisconsin. And, and there's something really scary about trusting any one state to do the right thing for all the other states. So, I mean, I, I, I would just sort of argue that I think we as individual voters are, are more powerful than that and deserve, I, I think, um, equality under the law in, in that um, you know, every vote should carry equal weight, regardless of where it comes from. And I actually, I pulled up a good graphic, if I can just take maybe like 30 more seconds on this. Um, but so th this map shows the 2016 election. Um, every state, every, I guess that's a hexagon, represents one electoral vote. And so the darker the blue, the more campaign events they had. So Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania all had um, between 41 and 71 uh, campaign visits. And the gray shows the states that had either zero or one or at most three. And as you can see, much of the country is ignored, including like really big geographic areas. So much of the South, except for Florida, is completely ignored. The entire West Coast, you know, people that might care about forest fires and earthquake preparedness uh, and safety regulations from the federal government, they're not being heard. And honestly, most of the Northeast as well, um, as New Hampshire kind of moves more from that battleground into a slightly more, you know, lean democratic state now. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just to kind of, when you think about, is it representative, if you look at this map, I don't think that those states, anyone would represent the country, but certainly together they're, they're really missing a lot of, of regional interests as well. 
And I, and I apologize, maybe I'll just take two more seconds on this. I, I think, you know, I, Eileen sort of hammered the most important point. When we talk about the way campaigns are run, um, you know, spending all of their time and all of their money in, in, in a small handful of states, that is a symptom of the deeper disease. I mean, we, I, I, it, we're not doing this because we're kicking and screaming to have more presidential you know, campaign ads on TV and rallies in our backyard. The, 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 the disease is the, is the um, morphing effect, the badly distortive effect that it has on the, pol on the development of policy. Every state brings its own local issues to a national election. And if that state happens to be a battleground state, the, those issues will drown out all of the rest of, of the debate around issues that may be in, important to states that are, are not political battleground, presidential battlegrounds. So, you know, one of the first groups to endorse national popular vote was the Sierra Club. And the reason was because at the time, the most competitive states in a presidential election were Rust Belt states. They weren't states where environmentalism was a particularly um, a, a topic that was at the forefront. Um, so, you know, I, I, and in dozens and dozens of debates on both sides, the term global warming, which was a little bit more in use at the time, climate change were not used once. It didn't come up because there was no value to talking about it. The issues around farming will not matter in a presidential general election unless Iowa happens to be a battleground state because there's nothing to be gained in, um, uh, you know, Florida by talking about the issues that are super important in Nebraska or Kansas. So I think, and, and actually, you know, the, the groups like the NAACP and the Urban League that have also uh, endorsed national popular vote, it's, it's hard to get presidential campaigns to talk about issues that are important to voters of color if, again, we're, we're conducting presidential elections in the oldest, most homogeneously white states in the country. So I, I think what's really important is that every state brings its issues to the table. If certain states matter more than the other states, those issues will dominate at the expense of every other state and their voters. Okay, thank you, Scott and Eileen. Um, does anybody else have any uh, more questions they'd like to ask or uh, even just minor minor points that you might have? Um, go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question if you want, please. And while you're thinking about that, I've got a couple. Uh, I got a couple things. So uh, I just want to show off here. I've been studying this issue, and I think we're all familiar with the term swing states or battleground states. But uh, I learned the other day that the states that are not swing states or battleground states are called spectator states. And so a lot of states are really just spectator states. And if you think about it, you know, I think we'd all rather be in the game. That's awful. Uh, That's awful. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll ask Scott and Eileen, have uh, people studied uh, voter turnout uh, to see whether uh, turnout is different between uh, spectator states and swing states? Yes. Um, so the Fair Vote uh, and the Brennan Center have both looked into this and their data shows that um, a swing state turnout is between nine and 11% higher um, in presidential election years than spectator states. And so I think that really shows that people know when their vote does not, is not necessarily determinative mm -hmm. of the outcome. Mm -hmm. And if you are, think that, oh, well, it doesn't really matter if I vote for what's at the top of the ticket, people are less inclined to turn out for, uh, you know, the rest of the down ballot races that everyone on this call knows are critically important. But when, you know, nationwide, we have a pretty abysmal voter turnout rate, I think we should be doing everything we can to make people uh, turn to turn out the vote and to to show up at the polls. And I think that a really, really big thing is uh, to change the way we elect the president. Um, something that I really like to point to is, um, so millennials, the, even the oldest millennials, they have spent at least 30% of their life under a president who is not originally elected by national po popular vote, or excuse me, was elected without the, the uh, being the winner of the national popular vote. Um, Gen Z, that number is 50%. So our youngest generation who's voting for the first time in a presidential election has spent half of their life or more 
under a president who was elected uh, despite losing the popular vote. And I honestly can't think of a bigger thing that's going to depress the turn the youth turnout vote um, than than that reality. Um, Skylar Van Valkenburg uh, down in um, sort of Henrico. Uh, about a year ago, I was having coffee with him, um, and you know, for those who don't know, Delegate Van Valkenburg, he he is a high school. Uh, his or AP government teacher. And um, it's, it's amazing to me, like the last bell rings and he goes and starts knocking on doors in his district. I don't know how you can be a teacher and campaign for office, but somehow he pulls it off. But he said, you know, I, I, I try to wrap my mind around explaining to my students how critical their participation is in an election. And then looking around and seeing, you know, a, a presidential election in practice that is, is demonstrating for them that their votes don't count. Because what better way to show people that their votes don't count than to conduct a national election for three, for, you know, the president of 330 million people in five, six, seven states. It, it, it is, he said it's, it's counterintuitive. So I think about that a lot just because you, I mean, the um, National Association of Secretaries of State in 2010 did a study into um, non-participation. Number one reason people give for not voting, my vote doesn't count. And you know, if, if, if your presidential election is reinforcing that, yeah, of course. But if, if you are a voter in Virginia, your vote for governor counts. Your vote for senator counts. Your vote in a state legislative district counts. Every single vote counts. If you're a voter in Texas or Louisiana, and by the way, four out of five voters of color live in non-competitive states, uh, you know, you're getting off of work at seven o'clock and you can either go stand in line until 11 p.m. and vote, or you can go home and, and vote for, and, and make dinner for your kids. Your state's pretty much a foregone conclusion what, what, which way it's gonna go in a presidential election. You know, so I, I think that does depress turnout. It, it, it reinforces the idea that your vote doesn't count. And there's nothing worse we could be doing in, in a democracy. Scott, thank you very much. Um, so uh, a little while ago, Scott, you mentioned something about the Sierra Club. And if I was listening close, I thought I heard you say that the Sierra Club uh, supports uh, the national popular vote. Is that right? Yep, uh, there's, uh, along with a whole list of groups I'm happy to go through. Could you just hit maybe the top three or four greatest hits on that on that list? Yeah, sure. No, not three, not three or four, but maybe maybe seven or eight. Uh, okay. So uh, the NAACP, the Urban League, um, the League of Women Voters, League of Conservation Voters, Sierra Club, um, the Brennan Center, the ACLU. You know, it, it's it's every nonpartisan group that is is focused on making the ballot uh, more accessible, uh, more accessible to more diverse uh, voting communities. Um, and, and we have a whole list of them at our, our website that, that you can uh, you can click on. Was Common Cause on that? Common Cause is on there. Fair Vote is on there. Um, Eileen, am I missing any any other major ones? There's, there's a bunch. Uh, I mean, I think you hit the big ones. Uh, yeah. Stand Up America. Um, yeah. I'm at, you know, and, and actually, you know, just to give you a sense of of. Uh, there, there are very few, if, if any, groups that have anti-national popular vote positions. Um, while remembering that we are a nonpartisan organization, and Eileen and I are talking to the Arlington County Democrats, um, I, will, I will list for you the groups that, that have anti-national popular vote positions. The RNC has passed a resolution against national popular vote. The National GOP platform has had an anti-national popular vote plank in it going back several cycles now. ALEC has passed a resolution against this. Um, and the, uh, oh, the, the Family Foundation of Virginia, thank you very much, and the Heritage Foundation. So, you know, again, the unfortunate thing is this has become far more partisan than it ever needed to be. We used to be able to get Republicans on the basis of some of the, the stats that Eileen mentioned before, that it is actually bad policy when certain states are, are rewarded for being a battleground state. Uh, if you look at the COVID funding bill, um, there was a Washington Post article where there was a White House aide who was quoted saying, look, um, anytime Governor DeSantis from Florida calls, uh, we listen because we know how important Florida is to the president's reelection campaign. Um, in the meantime, states like Virginia, uh, Colorado were um, hurting 
trying getting 40%, 50% of what they'd asked for in the bill and from the national stockpile. The, the perversity of that, that, that we are literally deciding which sick people to treat based on who is more electorally relevant. Those are the kind of points we used to be able to, I think they used to be more salient with Republicans. The other point is also political. It is not a monolithic um, truism that this will benefit, Dem uh, that the, the national popular vote benefits Democrats every time. If you flip 60,000 votes in Ohio in 2004, John Kerry would have become the president of the United States, despite the fact that he would have lost the popular vote by a larger margin than Donald Trump did. So, you know, it cuts both ways. It, the current system probably in the short run favors Republicans just a little bit. But, you know, at the end of the day, if a Republican candidate gets more votes than the Democrat, that person should be president, period, full stop. So I, I think that's, that's, you know, for as partisan as it has gotten, there is a, a I think, a, a real frustration on our part that that is what frames it because it, 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 is, it is a good government, good democracy thing first and a, and a partisan thing 27th. Great, thank you so much. And we have a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, one from Ann Snow and Boss, who's from Maryland and uh, Maryland has already passed it and, and she votes in a spectator state. Uh, the question is, what can she do to help with this campaign and which are the most critical states to convince? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, so if you are in a state that has already passed our bill, um, the best thing that you can do, so nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer. If you sign up through uh, that part of the website, it'll send all your information directly to me um, and I'll get you plugged in. We have you know, sometimes we do phone banking into voters in critical states, asking them to contact their legislators and getting them connected, um, writing a letter to the editor, even in your paper, uh, and reaching out to your friends and family that are in states that haven't yet passed the bill and let them know that this is a really important campaign and that they have an opportunity to help change the way that we elect the president and to do it by 2024. Um, so this is just, it's a campaign that I think more and more people need to know about uh, because as we're approaching that, uh, you know, the next presidential election down the road, uh, we want this to be the way that we elect the president. There's a lot of work to do between now and then to make that a reality. Um, from that, I'll kind of pivot to um, if you're in Virginia, um, all of that also applies of you know, signing up nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer. Um, if you want to write your legislator in support of this bill, um, you know, we can talk to your state legislators until we're blue in the face about how important this bill is, but they want to hear from you. Um, so an easy way to write them is just, and I'll put these links in the chat, but nationalpopularvote.com slash VA for Virginia. Um, and that'll take you to a page where you can send them an email and let them know that this is something you want to see action on. You don't want to see this delayed until the, a future year. You don't want to see them vote against it. You want to see them take action because this is a really important um, issue. And Scott, do you want to take the second half of that question about uh, our priority campaigns? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, right now, as I mentioned, we have 196 electoral votes. Um, we need 74 more to, to get to where, to, to 270. Right now, among the places we are working um, are, are, so Virginia is, is really at the top of the list. Um, it's, it's where uh, Eileen and I both spent um, a, a ton of time in, I think, more or less, I was there more or less every week uh, up until about March 1st uh, from the beginning of the year. So Virginia is, is the most critical state for us going into 2021. Um, other states like Minnesota uh, and Michigan, where we both have, where in both cases we have sort of a long history of, of bipartisan support that we're kind of hoping will be a little bit more open once Trump isn't, you know, whether he wins or loses, isn't hanging uh, so, uh, looming so large over the, the election, the next election. Um, but uh, so let me just, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Michigan, states like Arizona um, are, are proving pretty interesting for us. Nevada has been an interesting place as well. So um, those, are, those are the main um, targets right now. I think you know, every state is so different. We, we get these questions all the time. We go, why don't you just go get Texas? Well, okay, Texas is an enormous uh, legislature that meets every two years for about 48 seconds. Um, so, you know, it, it's a really hard state to get. It, every state has very, very different rules for how bills come to the floor and 
uh, how they get stopped up. Of the 16 states that have, have passed it so far, they tend to be the ones that have been the most ignored. So the case, it was really easy to make to a place like Delaware that, hey, you're kind of left out of a national conversation. Um, you know, the, the states where we're working now are places that were, were more likely than not uh, battlegrounds uh, in recent memory or maybe even currently. So it's, it's a little bit of a tougher sell um, to states that, that sort of see the benefit of, of being those narrowly divided states now. Um, but, you know, that, st that status is, is fleeting. In, in 1992, California was a battleground state. Uh, in 2016, certainly in 2012, Virginia was a battleground state. Not, not anymore. You guys did almost too good of a job. So, um, you know, I, I think that 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 uh, playing field changes over the over time. But for now, that's kind of where we're looking the most closely. Excellent. Thank you so much. We have just a few minutes left. Um, I see another question in the chat box from Fatima who is curious about um, if any of the GOP groups have stated the reason uh, to ex what the rationale is to explain their position against uh, the amendment. Stated rationale. Stated rationale. Uh, so, and, and I will, I, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a file in the chat here that you're, you're more than welcome to look at. This is usually a document that I share with, um, legislators and it's it's a rebuttal document that it really is just pulled from our our uh our book but sort of the most common questions that that come up in a um uh, a, a debate and, and sort of the answers to those they are almost um always around things like well this is unconstitutional or it's probably unconstitutional or um you know it's, it's probably inconsistent with the founders and, and their intent or uh, this is going to lead to a bunch of lawsuits. It, it goes from kind of the, the very broad base. This just isn't, is, somehow isn't right, um, or it's inconsistent with history, to the more kind of exotic things like, well, what if you had a, um, you know, a governor or a secretary of state who just, uh, you know, didn't want to turn in their vote totals, and they were going to keep those vote totals secret. There are about 14 reasons why that could never happen. But that, that's one of the challenges with the national popular vote. It takes about 30 seconds to throw a bunch of mud at a wall, but it takes hours to clean it up and explain issue by issue, objection by objection, why that hasn't happened. And again, going back to something we said earlier, 90% of the time, the answer is, to the extent that's a problem under national popular vote, it's a problem with the current system times 10. Um, and, and Eileen referenced this earlier. One of the things that we're going to have going for us in terms of, of fostering a conversation from November 3rd till the Electoral College meets on, on December 14th, the full range of flaws with the current system will be on glaring display for the entire country to see. To the extent that we think the Electoral College diffuses certain issues, it will amplify them in ways that people never even considered. Um, and, and we'll see that to our own detriment. And, and hopefully, I think that will um, spur a certain amount of urgency in, in both legislators and activists. Yeah, I just want to give a big uh, amen to what Scott just said. Um, this afternoon, I, I kept myself awake and in a state of almost terror because I read both the New Yorker article that came out yesterday or today, and then today, a new article in The Atlantic came out that's uh, really long, and it explains all the ways that this uh, election is going to be, like, seriously messed up. And um, it's, it's a parade of horribles, uh, and it's all because we have this bizarre electoral college system that I don't think, you know, the, the U.S. Constitution was adopted almost 250 years ago. There have been a lot of countries have adopted constitutions in the meantime. I don't think any of those other constitutions have included an electoral college. And I think there's probably a reason for that. Um, but um, I, this whole issue is gonna get a lot of attention. Uh, the month starting November 3rd is gonna be even more intense than the rest of 2020 has been um, for people that pay attention to, to current events and national events. So. Um, I want to thank um, Scott and Eileen very much. You guys have been really great as far as explaining all the details of this and all the nuances. 
And I want to thank um, our audience for having some excellent questions. And I want to thank Arlington Democrats for sponsoring this event. Um, we want an involved uh, uh, citizenry that uh, gets engaged on these difficult issues. And if we're going to keep our democracy, we all need to uh, be knowledgeable and, and talk about this stuff. So I want to thank you all for coming out. Anybody have any last words or last questions? Okay, we're, we're right about at our time. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. And, and um, Doug, I, just want to, I put both uh, my contact information and Eileen's in. If people have follow-up and uh, questions that they'd like to send us by email, we're, we're happy to uh, uh, talk to people one off as well. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. And thank you, Eileen. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank, thank you, you for hosting us. Thanks for having us. I, uh, I hope to see some of you either virtually in the future with you if you get involved with our grassroots group in Virginia. So thanks for your time tonight.